Berserk and the Band of the Hawk, or Berserk Muso, is a manga Sparknote simulator developed by Omega Force and released in October 2016 in Japan for the PlayStation 3, 4, and Vita, and four months later in the West, which also included a worldwide release for Windows. The game takes the gameplay and structure of Omega Force's Muso games, the most notable example being the Dynasty Warrior series, and applies it onto the Berserk universe, and effectively uses that to adapt the events of the manga from issue 1 all the way to issue 32 into a video game format, with some exceptions. This is the third and final video of a series in which I discuss and review the three Berserk video games that have so far been released. Links to the videos for the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 games are located in the description, which I would recommend watching as I will be making references and comparisons to those two games. If you're watching this and are somehow new to Berserk itself, it's a manga series created by the manga artist and writer Kentaro Miura, and primarily covers the exploits of a lone swordsman named Guts fighting against demonic forces attempting to kill him in the name of the sacrificial brand on the back of his neck. If you truly haven't had any experience with Berserk and were hoping to get into the series, I would not recommend this game as an introduction to the series because while the game covers a healthy portion of the events of what is at this point most of the manga, quite a lot is skipped over in the interest of hastening the plot to get to the next fight scene or battle or whatever. This video will of course contain spoilers for many events of the manga, so if you have any interest in getting into Berserk, my first and highest recommendation is to just read the manga. The 1997 anime and the three Golden Age movies both cover the beginning half of all the events covered in the game, and the 2016 anime extends a bit further beyond that, but at the time of this video, the manga is really your only choice if you want to explore all the events covered in this game before diving into the game itself. It's also the best way to experience Berserk for the first time anyway. I've heard tell from an unconfirmed source that Berserk was actually an inspiration for the creation of the Dynasty Warriors franchise, so it seems the ability to create an actual Berserk game in the style of Dynasty Warriors was a dream come true for Omega Force. The directors for this particular Muso have stated that they are fans of Berserk, but the fact that Berserk inspired the entire Muso genre was never mentioned in any interviews that I read. Then again, these guys weren't with the company at the time Dynasty Warriors was created, so it's possible they didn't even know. My doubt increased when it was revealed that the decision to create a Berserk Muso was only ever considered after the anime production committee behind what would become the 2016 Berserk adaptation approached Koei Tecmo themselves to have them produce a game to coincide with the release of their new anime, and even offered the team permission to use footage from their Golden Age movies. It seems to me that if someone really wanted to create a Berserk Muso, this would have been the other way around, but it's not like I know all the facts either. Dear Joe Donnelly, please tell me where the hell you heard this, yours truly variable XOXOXO. Can you believe he didn't reply back? The game indeed uses movie footage to help fill in certain events between missions, but due to the fragmented nature of it and the fact that many scenes are omitted for brevity, this is very much not a suitable alternative to simply watching the movies on their own either. Furthermore, much of the explicit content such as nudity and excessive gore have been censored or removed as well. In other words, part of the artistic merit present in the story and atmosphere of Berserk had to be shewn off to appease a ratings board, leading further support to my recommendation to just watch the anime or read the manga instead. This is a bit of a tangent, but bear with me. The graphic imagery in Berserk isn't meant to tease out some latent sadistic desire. It's there so that you'll more fully appreciate the proper tone of those scenes. Actually seeing a character you've grown attached to get ripped in half or decapitated delivers a far more serious tone than just hearing some tearing noises off screen. This is less a criticism directed towards the game, as the developers probably did the best they could to keep the content reasonably graphic, and more so regarding ratings in general, as developers are pressured to tone down content in order to ensure that their game sells under the desired rating, since retailers are unlikely to sell products with a rating higher than Mature or its equivalents. This is what thwarts certain artistic visions, but at least the kitties are safe from that goddamn nipple, right? Since different restrictions are applied to different mediums under different contexts, this is another hurdle that can often cripple the proper context in an adaptation, as it has here. One can only hope the proliferation of digital distribution will curb this in the future. I'm taking the time to explain all this because the target audience for this game is quite specifically Berserk fans. Beginners can get a good grasp of the general structure of the story and characters, but I would highly, highly recommend against it as any of the alternatives, yes, even the 2016 anime, are far superior adaptations. But once again, even though I know you're sick of hearing it, the manga is by far your best option. I would describe the main conceit of Muso games, particularly the licensed ones, to be a sort of wish fulfillment. A chance to play as your favorite characters and slaughter hundreds of enemies in your wake, to go through the events of the story and sort of act it out yourself, and to see certain features from a slightly different perspective. While the adaptation is mostly faithful, preservation of 100% accuracy is not the goal of the game, so if you don't know anything about Berserk going in, you're not really going to appreciate or perhaps even understand all that's going on.
Because the game covers so much of the manga, and because, for the most part, it doesn't ever really stray from the story as it's written, I won't be bothering to cover the story beat for beat as I did in the last two videos. I would essentially just be poorly summarizing the events of the manga, and you'd be better off just reading it yourself instead. I'll try to explain things as I go along, but non-fans may have a harder time following along than those who know the story, so consider yourself warned. So, Berserk and the Band of the Hawk is the second Berserk game ever brought over to the West, and while two out of three ain't bad, before we can begin to talk about the actual game, we need to have another little chat regarding translations. Once again, we need to discuss that title. Berserk and the Band of the Hawk is, first of all, a very awkward, clunky, and questionable title. Especially when they could have just called it Berserk Warriors instead. Which to me would have been simpler and made a lot more sense. It portrays the premise of the game much more clearly, although you may want to cross out the S at the end. More on that in a moment. But to the point, the largest problem with the title is the Band of the Hawk portion. This is the name of the mercenary troop that Griffith leads, but it's actually widely considered to be a mistranslation. The correct title would be Band of the Falcon. I briefly mentioned this in the Sword of the Berserk review, but now I'll explain it fully. And as before, I should stress that I'm by no means an expert in translations. This is just what I've learned through basic Google research. This confusion between names arises due to the Japanese word Taka, which can be translated as either Hawk or Falcon. In Japanese, there's no difference. They're completely interchangeable. Around the time that Berserk was first being translated, there didn't seem to be any indication as to whether it should be Hawk or Falcon, and since the two birds are so similar, it didn't really seem to matter. So translators arbitrarily decided to use Hawk, perhaps because it sort of rolls off the tongue a bit easier in English. This started in fan translations, but made its way to official translations, and even official dubbing of the anime. Nothing less from the commander of the Hawks Raiders, you're a- God damn it! Yeah. For Captain Guts! You did a good job. Thanks, Captain Guts! If I got a little carried away out there, did. I apologize. There was never any definitive consensus, but fans eventually began supposing that Falcon was actually correct when the Millennium Falcon arc came about, as it seemed to be an obvious Star Wars reference as opposed to Millennium Hawk. In a response to a letter sent by Skullknight.net in 2009, Miura himself confirmed that he used Taka to mean Falcon, as inspired by the Millennium Falcon spaceship from Star Wars. So most fans have since taken to accepting Band of the Falcon as the true interpretation, though there's still some debate as to whether it was always meant to be Falcon or if there was a change at some point. Regardless, most official translations were unwilling to switch the terminology on a dime as it could have confused readers and instead chose to continue on with Band of the Hawk. Then the translators of the three Golden Age films in 2012 had a chance to effectively start over and could have made the switch, but they as well stuck with Band of the Hawk so that they'd match up with official manga translations. It's this pressure to retain consistency that is likely the reason why Band of the Hawk has stubbornly stuck around and why it was used for this game, but it comes across as a misstep in the minds of fans who are unhappy to see this improper translation not only in the game, but prominently adorned across the cover. Another reason why Berserk Warriors would have made a preferable title. Now that's just the title, but the translational oddities still run deeper and on a more embarrassing level. If you've watched the previous two videos, you'll recall that Sword of the Berserk had some poor translations, but the team involved likely had little to no source material, so they did the best that they could. Millennium Falcon was a simple fan translation by a single person, so it's hard to fault the guy too much for a few mistakes here and there. This time around, Berserk has carved out a place for itself in the West, and the translation was handled by what I assume are industry professionals, but there's still a bunch of mistakes strewn all throughout. I'm telling you, man, Berserk just can't catch a break, can it? To be fair, the translation overall is decent enough. There just didn't seem to be a whole lot of proofreading involved. Spelling errors and wonky grammar are thankfully the worst of it. But still, this implicates a lack of care on behalf of the translation team. Either that or the result of strict deadlines. In our internet-dominant world, however, there's little stopping them from patching the game and correcting these typos. But the fact that they haven't years after release again supports the idea that there wasn't a whole lot of care directed towards this localization. But hey, while I'm out passing judgment, I might as well take this time to correct some of my own mistakes, because at least I care. In the last video, I referred to this creature simply as the wolf. However, I've since learned that it's been more generally referred to as the Beast of Darkness, as it's never specified to be a wolf at all. It's really more my headcanon to call it a wolf, though it may also be more accurate to call it a hound, since that's the animal which represents Guts in a sort of dream sequence later on in the manga. In much the same way that Griffith is represented by a white falcon, Guts comes to be represented by a black hound, which fits thematically as hounds are generally exemplified by their characteristics in hunting or in chasing things wildly, which is exactly the mode of being Guts finds himself in after the eclipse. But to my credit, some adaptations accompany the Beast of Darkness with a wolf's howl, so it's not entirely unreasonable to refer to it as such. There's technically no correct interpretation, but Beast seems to be the most appropriate and encompassing term for this particular character, and this is also the term that the game itself correctly uses, so that's what I'll be calling it from now on. This is also somewhat related to the Beherits, which are translated as Behelets in the game. 
The fact that in Japanese the letter R is often used as a liquid consonant throws a wrench in translation and it can really go either way. You may have heard that the primary argument for the hard R is that Beherit is the Syriac word for devil or Satan. I mean, that's what it says on the wiki, but a bit of Google research shows that there are no sources to confirm this other than this one guy who just says so on a music website. Hopping onto a translator, the result I get for plugging in Satan is this. And it's pronounced something like Satana or Satana. Not even devil or demon result in anything even remotely close to Beherit. So as far as I can tell, this statement I hear thrown around all the time is just flat out wrong. However, I did find one source linking the name Beherit to the demon Baal Bereth, which due to his connection with Baal Zebub, could still lead you to Satan. But my concern is with the Bereth portion, also spelled as Berit, which is a Hebrew word that means covenant, and creating a Beret covenant often involved blood. See where I'm going? Given the nature of the eggs of Berserk, I find this to be a much more convincing origin for their name. Just as when Guts was called Gatsu at the start because translators didn't realize that the word was a Japanese emulation of an English word. If you take Barret and stretch out the pronunciation a little to make it conform to Japanese word structure, then it's totally sensible to eventually end up with something like Beherito. So in a way, if my theory is correct, which I suspect that it is since that Syriac thing is dead in the water, Barret may actually be the proper translation for this object, or at least a reference. I mean, you can look into it yourself, the similarities are quite substantial. But since I can't be 100%, I'll be doing a bit of conforming to retain consistency myself and be using Beherit for the video, as it's close enough, just not for the reason that's so often cited elsewhere. I also mentioned in the first video that Susumu Hirasawa had composed music for all three games, but that was incorrect as well, as none of his music is present in this game. I had assumed that since his music was in the movies, and parts of the movies were in the game, his music would technically be present, or that he'd at least write a theme track like last time, or something like that, but... Nope! Omega Force actually replaced the movie's music with their own. Maybe it was a licensing thing, maybe Hirasawa was too busy composing for the new anime... I don't know. The whole soundtrack was made in-house, but we'll cover that when we come to it. Anyway, you've booted up the game for the first time, but what kind of background info does the game provide for newcomers on a fresh new save? Physical releases of the game lack any sort of manual, so there's nothing to be gleaned there. But in-game you have some character menus where you can read up on some short blurbs describing character attributes and personalities, and a couple things regarding the world. Much like in Sword of the Berserk, this kind of spoils what you will and will not find throughout the game. The presence of Ganishka, for example, tells you that the game goes at least a ways into the Millennium Falcon arc. I know I would have preferred to have discovered that organically. Disregarding that, even though I oppose playing this game without knowing about Berserk beforehand, I still would have preferred some of these bios be locked until encountered in-game to preserve some of the reveals for newcomers, or even veterans who just didn't know what to expect. Not a huge issue since this is something you sort of have to go out of your way to find, but it still could have been handled better than leaving it all open from the get-go. You can tell I'm never satisfied about these sort of things, it's always too much or too little. And by the way, I should mention now that the way I pronounce certain names is merely my own subjective interpretation. For example, I call this kid Isidro, but the official dead they call him Isidoro, which is oddly literal. I'm Isidoro! I think of that first O as a sort of buffer sound, kind of like all those U's in Beru Zeruku. But whatever, I'm not going to rationalize the way I say every single name. The point is, my pronunciations may vary from other sources you may hear, so don't freak out if I say it differently from someone else. Again, I'm not the authority on this sort of thing, as much as I like to make myself sound like I am. Anyway, now that we're all properly informed, I hope, let's start her up and see what we got our hands on. Okay, looks like we have one more thing to address first. So, if you've seen the 2016 anime, you may have identified that striking sound effect just now as the infamous clang. If you haven't seen the anime, well, I think this clip speaks for itself. There's a lot of things to dislike about the anime, and one of the biggest is the overuse of this clang sound effect, which is forgivable in metal striking metal, but it even gets used when striking non-metal things. And in general, it's just loud, obnoxious, and sounds kinda dumb. Perhaps the most interesting thing about this sound effect is that it comes from the same sound library used by many Source games, such as Half-Life 2, Left 4 Dead, and Team Fortress 2. The actual sound is Metal Solid Impact Bullet 4, but slowed down. So, it looks like the anime studio also gave Omega Force some of their sound effects, and with that clang sound as maligned as it is, it makes for an unfortunate, although somewhat comedic, first impression. Thankfully, they layered the clang with some other sound effects, like the sound of crunching bones and spraying blood, so it's not as offensive as the anime, and I actually don't mind the way it's been used here as much. But, uh... 
Nope. Can't stall any longer. We're going to be going a bit backwards in structure from the previous videos, where I'll be covering mostly the gameplay to start off with, and then afterwards talk more about how it fits together with the story. But let's just begin already. So obviously we're dealing with a Musou here, which gives the confusing impression that this is a spin-off game of what never really had a main series to begin with, considering the previous two games were so different from one another despite being developed by the same company. But, uh, here we are anyway. For those of you who may not know, a Musou is a game where you play as one of several choosable characters and effortlessly slaughter hundreds of defenseless mooks and make your way to fight slightly tougher mooks in order to capture bases or accomplish some other objective such as protecting civilian units or fighting a stage boss, with various different failure conditions that change mission to mission. Basically, you just do whatever the game prompts you to do and obliterate whatever stands in your path while you do it. It's simple, repetitive, but can potentially feel quite satisfying to mow down horde after horde of enemies. I have little experience with Musos myself. I remember playing one or two of the titles with a friend on this PS2, but I never had any desire to get my own copies or anything. This game is the first Muso I've ever actually owned, and also the first that I've bothered to play all the way through. So, it's important you understand that I'm inexperienced and impartial to these games from the start. It's the kind of game that appeals to a very specific audience, and is typically scorned outside of that audience. A style over substance scenario, gameplay is often frenetic and flashy, but lacking in much depth to satisfy anyone interested in anything that may lie beneath the surface. This, unsurprisingly, applies to Berserk and Band of the Hawk as well, which is the short version of this review. But what makes this particularly egregious is how it lacks content present in most other Musos. You'll see what I mean as I go along, but first, let's discuss how the combat works. Every character, of which there are eight in total, has a unique fighting style associated with them. The eight characters are Guts, Griffith, Casca, Judo, Zod, Wild, Serpico, and Shirk. Some characters have alternate forms, such as Mercenary Guts, Black Swordsman Guts, and Berserker Guts, Zod and Wild's Apostle transformations, and Griffith's transformation into Femto. Did I mention spoilers? Yeah? Okay, good. The selection of characters is fairly light, and I'll cover that in greater detail later, but first let's take a peek at Guts' combo list. As paltry as it is on its own, if we now take a look at all the other characters' combo lists... Well, wouldn't you know it, they're all dizzyingly similar. While everyone technically has different attack styles, all characters share the nearly identical two-button combat system, where you chain a series of normal attacks, then follow it up with a stronger attack that changed depending on how many normal attacks preceded it. And by now it should already be quite clear that the animations and weight of attacks for Guts here are decidedly less satisfying than they were in the PS2 game. It's certainly not bad, and definitely better than the Dreamcast game, and the clashing sound effects do a pretty decent job of making up some of the ground lost by the more rapid swings. For this different style of game where you're expected to slice through far more enemies at once relatively quickly, a slightly faster swing speed is to be expected. And while I do think they could have fine-tuned it a bit better, perhaps just with animations alone, I don't find it too excessive since you can still feel the difference in attack speed and range to be fairly dramatic if you switch characters. It's possible that it could have been done better, but all things considered, I'm fairly content with what's present. Although Berserker Guts is a bit, uh... Ugh. Every character has access to a block and a dash, the block perhaps being the most useless move in the entire game, as I can't think of a single time when I ever actually had to use it. The only time when I could think it would have been useful was against bosses, but they all hit through your guard anyway, so there was no point and I ended up just never using it ever. It's much easier to just dash away or behind an enemy to avoid an attack, and then deal out punishment instead. Characters also have sub-weapons, such as throwing knives, crossbows, bombs, and character-specific abilities. Some sub-weapons are more effective with some characters than others, such as Judo's ability to carry a higher amount of knives, but these were things I found mostly going ignored as well, since normal attacks were often much more effective. Even the arm cannon somehow managed to be unsatisfying and failed to deliver any meaningful level of power or usefulness, so for a majority of time, it sat unused. By delivering or taking damage, a frenzy meter on the bottom right fills up, which once filled can be activated to supercharge your attacks and temporarily prevent you from being able to take any damage. Damage and kills done in this mode will fill a second meter, which once filled allow the player to unleash a super attack, which deals a huge amount of damage over a wide area of effect. Some characters' super attacks are more devastating than others, but this goes some ways to preventing them all from feeling too similar. They all have their own uses in a pinch and are, for the most part, worth looking forward to. Determining when and how to fill up and activate these meters is, I would say, where the primary level of depth of combat exists, as it's extraordinarily effective when dealing with tougher enemies and bosses. What bothers me the most about these meters is that after you've taken enough damage, your frenzy meter will just begin to fill up on its own. Now, I wouldn't mind if the meter filled up a little bit faster the lower your health is, which could add a nice risk-reward aspect to managing your health, and also help give you that last-ditch push when you find yourself on your last leg. 
Your meters filling up is a sort of micro reward you're given for engaging in combat and risking damage, but being able to just run away from the fray, let your meter fill up and then charge back in with your invincible frenzy is what we in the business refer to as dangerously cheesy. When it comes to the enemies you fight, they come in three main varieties, which for the purposes of this video we'll refer to as fodder, captains, and character units. The fodder units are incredibly weak, dying in only about two hits depending on who you play as, and are apparently too frightened by your raw might to even bother trying to attack you. It's only by cranking the difficulty to the max where they'll gain the courage to even try attacking you and pose as any sort of threat. But this then reveals the reason why they're often so inert, as they have a habit of stunlocking you with no recourse. This, in theory, adds a bit of depth in managing your positioning and surroundings, but their sheer numbers makes the likelihood of becoming surrounded beyond your control quite likely, and getting caught in an inescapable stun lock is beyond frustrating. They just weren't designed properly to actually fight back. Ideally, they should act to chip your health down over time and only occasionally stun you, but as it stands, they're either stupidly ineffective or unfairly overwhelming. For the most part, these enemies exist to fight your ally troops, which over time can affect which side has the advantage in terms of numbers, which theoretically affects the morale of your army and their effectiveness in combat, at least in the missions that you have an army, which are remarkably few. On standard difficulties, these enemies are so laughably inept that it robs the player the satisfaction of slicing through them. It's like playing Tetris with nothing but line pieces. They do get slightly more aggressive as the game progresses, but not nearly enough to dissuade you from just running past them to get to the captains. And the habit of running past enemies is very easy to develop since many of the optional challenges involve accomplishing them in under a time limit, encouraging you to ignore everything else with no consequence. I mean, check it out. Even in this mission where I have to escort Casca through a whole army, she just runs right past them like they don't even seem to acknowledge her. Captains are the tougher variety of enemies that will actively attack you and can withstand quite a few blows before going down. These enemies are often the target of many of your objectives and are often the only enemies that are ever required to defeat, whilst fodder can mostly be ignored unless you're going for body count or building up your meters. Captains scale in difficulty and hardiness as the game goes on, so when you encounter a new one, you do well to examine how they now interact rather than trying to brute force them. They still manage to be quite similar to each other, but it's enough to make you feel like you're actually fighting stronger enemies. Finally, character units are your primary host of characters with their own unique movesets. They are often used as the bosses for missions, complete with their own special health bars. They of course have the most health and actually require a modicum of strategy when facing them. If you're anything like me, that strategy usually involves killing fodder enemies to build up my gauges and then just laying into the boss and brute forcing my way through all their attacks until they fall. And if there's no fodder, well, those auto-failing meters will do the job for you. There are also horses which you can ride and attack enemies from atop, but 99% of the time you'll be using them for mobility reasons, as attacking from one is ineffective and maneuverability is too quick and jerky to allow for much of any control for fighting with any precision. And when enemies are on horses, well, it's almost a complete non-issue, as they are just as terrible at combat on one as you are, and it's very easy to just walk up and knock them off, after which they won't even attempt to get back on. The horses also really highlight how useless the in-game camera is. I'm half convinced that the camera literally will not do anything without the player moving it themselves, and even at the highest camera speed, you simply can't get it to move fast enough to keep up with your movements. So much of the difficulty in combat can actually come from contorting your hand to move your character, camera, and input attacks with enough synchronicity to be able to see what you're doing and where the enemies are. Not to mention the lovely occasions when a boss can pin you into a corner with their long-lasting stun attacks and completely obfuscate your vision of what's even going on or when an opening appears for you to dash out, leaving you no choice but to just mash and pray. Each mission you're given, you'll be given an objective of some kind and a failure condition. Sometimes. Sometimes it tells you there is no failure condition, but I can assure you that letting the enemy hack you to pieces will eventually result in a loss. The opening mission after the prologue has you fighting as a mercenary against another army. You're told to be mindful of your army's numbers versus the enemy's and that defeating certain captains and claiming bases is a way to keep your army's numbers up and morale up. This gives you the false impression that the game is mostly going to follow this format, and it does for a little while. However, after Guts leaves the Band of the Falcon, the entire army mechanics are almost completely dropped and you become an army of one. This highlights the fact that the army on your side was a hindrance for the most part, since you basically had to babysit your captains in order to keep them alive. And while it sounds bothersome, it added a bit of depth to the mission, since your attention had to be split between fulfilling your objectives, but also not ignoring your army so much that they get eradicated in your absence. Once you're alone, things get a lot simpler, and a lot more boring. What's especially odd is that most missions still have bases to capture, despite any potential usefulness for them being completely gone. Maps are either very small or hallway-like, and lacking any sort of tactical thinking you may be able to have. For instance, let's say you have three bases and three lanes of enemies assaulting those bases. Even though your character is effectively an unkillable god, you can still plug in some tactical planning on how you take out these three simultaneous assaults. 
perhaps by alternating lanes, laying down traps, destroying barracks. The game could even throw in a wrench by sending an enemy character unit to wreak further havoc which will split your attention even more. Not unlike a third-person MOBA. I'm not saying that's how every mission should be structured, but all the elements are in place to make such a scenario possible, but are never even remotely used that way. There's a skeletal frame of a game here, but no attempt made to introduce any creative elements or push or expand implementations to any lengths. For the most part, the game just cares about your ability to reach objective points and kill the strong enemies quickly, without any regard or consequence to which order you do them. So most of the time you're battling through an entirely mindless and linear progression of events as the game prompts you to go kill those guys, then go and kill those guys, then go and kill those guys, then go- That said, Band of the Hawk does at least have the previous two games beaten mission variety. Even if most mission objectives focus on killing captain enemies, it frames them a little bit different each time. Sort of like how every game of Risk is a bit different depending on how many people play and who gets which countries. Now I know that ain't much, but each small difference spread across its sheer quantity of levels manages to at least put it ahead of its predecessors. Another way it does this is with its challenges, identified by Beherits. Some missions will have special objectives which, if completed, will reward you with a Beherit, which will unlock a portion of a scrambled piece of artwork. Once you collect them all, the game automatically unscrambles them for you and all you get is this barely interactable 3D version of the picture. Some Beherits seem to be genuine challenges, like defeat certain enemies within a time limit, while others are just unavoidable consequences of the mission itself, like defeat the boss or survive. They're basically just freebies given out throughout the story to make it feel like you're earning something. But of course, handouts just feel like handouts. The time limit challenges are also odd since there's no way of knowing what the time limit even is. Even when repeating the mission, no indication is given how much time you have to complete the objective, so you just gotta do it as fast as you can and hope you were quick enough, which is just annoying. It doesn't take too long of playing or watching this game to see that there isn't much to the gameplay. Perform a certain combo depending on the immediate enemies around you, build up and release frenzy mode and super attacks when necessary, make your way to and defeat the indicated enemies, wash, rinse, and repeat. This isn't a dissimilar setup from the PS2 game, but the sheer number of enemies you slice through devalues what little satisfaction you may have had from making a kill. In the previous game, if you could manage to cut through three or sometimes even four enemies in a single swing, it felt quite satisfying. But here, you don't get that satisfaction because it happens every swing. And that combo counter in the bottom, I... I don't even know if it actually even does anything. So there's not a whole lot of depth in a single character. Okay but by then giving you access to multiple different characters and their unique playstyles, that injects variety into a playthrough. Even after you've learned the ins and outs of every single character, the ability to choose your preferred style for a given situation is a compelling enough level of decision-making between missions to keep you at it. Okay, game, I say. You make a convincing argument. Can I have that, then? I ask. And the game says, yeah, sure, here you go. And then the game gave me 30 consecutive missions where I could only play as Guts. Now, over the course of the story, you'll unlock a total of 7 out of the 8 playable characters, However, because the main story mode follows along with the events of the manga, an overwhelming majority of the missions are restricted to being played as Guts and Guts only. In fact, out of 47 missions, only 6 allow you the opportunity to play someone other than Guts. By count, that's about 13%, but by actual playtime, it's much worse. To help counteract this lack in variety, Guts' fighting style will change very slightly over time, such as when he acquires the Dragon Slayer. However, this doesn't have much of a profound effect, as the changes are slight and your playstyle as Guts is unlikely to change at all. You'll just notice some of the swings look a little bit different. From what I've come to understand, part of the appeal of Musos is that you can play as multiple different characters, pick your favorite, or mix it around from mission to mission, or even just play as one through the whole thing. The point is you get to choose who and for how long. Games in the style of Sword of the Berserk and Millennium Falcon didn't have this issue since you didn't have any preconceived notion of playing as more than one character, and thus wouldn't be bothered by that restriction. However, if you were a Musou fan, being forced to play as Guts for such a large portion of the game's story may leave you disappointed. Part of Berserk's identity includes heroes battling hordes of enemies, yes, but it's also quite substantially focused on a lone swordsman, and translating that part of Berserk's identity onto a Musou is just a poor fit. It certainly feels odd to be confronted with all these character options mission after mission, and so infrequently be confronted with the ability to actually play as any of them throughout the main story mode. And I'll get to free mode in just a moment, but I want to mention that many of the Warriors games are known for having a much higher number of playable characters. It's part of their identity, it's an essential element that makes a Musou a Musou. At times they even reach counts above 100. Band of the Hawk has 8. Now, comparing Band of the Hawk to one of Omega Force's main series is unfair, as they've been developing one far longer than the other, and different teams within Omega Force worked on different titles. However, even compared to other licensed Musos, Band of the Hawk's roster is still fairly small. It's difficult to find definitive counts, especially in regards to DLC and such, but from what i found, Dragon Quest Heroes has about 14, Hyrule Warriors made its way to roughly 30, and Fire Emblem Warriors is listed as having 32. And it's not as if Berserk has a shortage of worthy contenders, either. Off the top of my head, Skull Knight, Silat, Pippin, Boscone, Azan, Mosgus, and Grunbeld 
all would have been prime choices with their own unique weapons and fighting styles, would have doubled the roster size, and there's still more excellent choices to put in. It's almost humorous that even though the game is called Berserk in the Band of the Hawk, half of that band's most notable characters are unplayable. Even Rickert, who is never known to be much of a fighter, is occasionally seen suited up in armor, so it wouldn't be too far of a stretch. There's certainly been stranger combatants in Amuso. And it's clear that many characters could have been playable, as almost all of my suggestions appear in the game in combat situations, so there was already plenty of work done on these characters, and it may not have been that much more work to make them playable. I think the primary reason for such a small roster is the fact that for most of the story, Guts is the only choosable character, whereas the other characters are mostly only playable with inside content, which you're not as likely to invest as much time into. It's entirely possible, and even likely, that a player would just play through the main story mode and not even touch the side content or any of the alternate characters, which to me is another reason why the story shouldn't have been following the manga, or specifically Guts, so strictly. So what kind of side content is there? Well, we have two options, Free Mode and Endless Eclipse. Free Mode lets you replay any mission as any other character. This is first of all a refreshing change of pace, as you'll likely have a valid reason to replay certain missions if you missed a Beherit, and doing so as another character can make this process much more tolerable. You do, however, have to contend with leveling up your characters you wish to play as, but the money you gain from playing through the first time should be enough to cover a healthy portion of levels across all the characters, and having a higher level isn't really a huge issue in the first place. Free Mode is also a fun opportunity to fulfill your most radical fantasies by pitting your favorite characters against each other. So instead of Guts vs. Zod, you could do Griffith vs. Zod, or Judo vs. Zod, or hell, even Zod vs. Zod. Does it make sense? No, but that's sort of the point. It's that kind of ability to shatter the status quo and just have fun with things that a Muso can use to provide added novelty and enjoyment. That faithfulness to the story exists the first time around, and now you're rewarded with a chance to do it again with whatever wacky combination of characters you can think of, if you really feel like putting yourself through that. Curiously, the game still feels a need to add Guts into the missions as an NPC ally, which I really don't understand. The narrative has been broken, logic thrown to the wind. Why is Guts still here? Is it because he has dialogue throughout the missions and is a part of some of the cutscenes? I still don't see why that's necessary. This is just a silly mode for fun. It doesn't need any consistency. Guts can exist as a talking head here. It doesn't matter. You've needlessly ruined the purity of my Casca vs. Griffith fantasy. But whatever. It's not likely that you're actually going to invest much time into this mode anyway. Maybe you will if you're desperate, but you're better off playing our second alternative game mode, Endless Eclipse. Endless Eclipse is pretty fun in that it breaks the rules for you. In Endless Eclipse, you choose a character and then fight through a never-ending series of short combat scenarios which make up the layers of the Eclipse. Every five layers, you're confronted with a job board, and you may choose which of the next series of five layers you wish to take on next for various rewards, which can involve collecting additional Beherits. Every 20 layers you delve, you reach a checkpoint from which you can continue on from if you either quit or die. The Eclipse will take you to any location in the game and will pair you against any and all combinations of other characters. So one mission you may be fighting with Skull Knight and the next you may be fighting against him. This is what I mean by the game breaking the rules for you. Of course, the situations you can find yourself in can get quite ridiculous, and seeing the different characters' reactions to them can also be rather humorous. Gestalt! You're alive! Damn it! Why aren't you dead, you <laughs> The deeper you go, the harder it gets, and while you could theoretically go on endlessly, the highest tier reward you can receive for each individual character is by completing layer 100, which can take a good while to get to itself, and there's not much incentive to bother going any further. Much like with the 100 animal murder mode in the previous game, this mode is actually much more enjoyable than any of the story missions. They're not weighed down by needing to follow a specific story structure and have a decent bit of variety packed in from layer to layer, so every few minutes the game changes in a small but meaningful way that can be somewhat enjoyable and hold your interest. The 20 layer checkpoints encourage you to play for a reasonable length of time at once, but you can take a break or switch to another character whenever you choose. Your layer progression won't carry over between characters, but you never feel compelled to stick with a single one all the way to the end in one go. You can choose to enter the Eclipse at any point after completing just a couple story missions, but to unlock all 100 layers, you have to complete the story mode entirely. This can act as a decent reprieve if the story begins to tire you, and thanks to the checkpoint system, you won't feel like you're wasting time or losing progress simply because you don't have all the layers unlocked yet. If I ever had to return to this game for whatever reason, you can bet I'd be playing Endless Eclipse. It's more akin to what I wish the main game would have been like, rather than a straight-up adaptation. Now that we've covered what is available for alternative game modes, we can now move on to what is not, specifically multiplayer. I would say the most fun I've had with a Muso game in the past is playing with a friend. Friendly competitions like seeing who can get the highest kill count or capture the most bases gives some much needed agency to the gameplay, but when you're just playing by yourself, you really have little to no incentive to do either of those things unless you're going for a Beherit or something. I'd like to think that maybe there are technical limitations, for instance split screen can be quite taxing, but even then an online element could have been used instead. Most other Musos have a multiplayer element, which is why its absence here is notable. If I had to guess, I'd say the lack of multiplayer, and perhaps also the reason for the small roster of playable characters, probably had something to do with deadlines. 
The team had a fairly small window to get the game out in time with the anime, and for that reason they probably weren't able to squeeze in as many features as they wish they could have. But on the other hand, in our DLC-filled world, these are things that could have been added in afterward. But two years after release, no plans have been announced, so it's probably fair to say that this isn't going to happen. The team was apparently more interested in selling costumes than making actual content. And that neatly wraps up pretty much all there is to say about the gameplay of this game, but we still really need to go over the story. And as I mentioned, I won't be going over the events of the story, but I do need to address how the story was integrated. Specifically, how it's easily the worst interpretation of Berserk Media I've ever consumed. And I've watched the 2016 anime. This is because Berserk is a very large and very dense story. Band of the Hawk tries to tell an enormous portion of that story, and as a result the pacing and content have been radically compromised. The brunt of the story is told occasionally through movie clips and cutscenes at first, but later primarily through these event scenes where characters kind of stand around and talk while emoting awkwardly with their faces. On many occasions, in fact, I would say most, cutscenes take up far more time than gameplay. This sometimes covers up for some loading times, but still takes up a huge chunk of time. Even skipping them is a bit of a chore, especially if you need to retry a mission multiple times to get up a Herod. Movie playback can be disabled, but not anything else. After almost every mission, or during scenes which I know will take a while, I find myself setting the controller down and just waiting. Missions rarely exceed 10 minutes in length, and the story between them has a habit of taking just as much, if not more, time between. I recorded gameplay one mission at a time, so if you compare the time it took me to complete a mission and subtract it from the total clip length, you can see how inordinately stacked many of these missions are in favor of cutscenes and dialogue events. Battle for Doldry, for example, had 9 minutes of gameplay, but including all the cutscenes and character dialogues up until I'm faced with the mission list again, the mission ended up taking 33 minutes. And the Eclipse? 12 minutes of gameplay, but a total mission length of 51 minutes. Granted, these are particularly egregious examples, and again, the cutscenes can be skipped, but if you want to enjoy the story elements of story mode, you'll be confronted with a very poor execution with chunks of story and gameplay told mostly independent of one another, and awkwardly shifting gears from one to the other and back and forth. Time to play a video game, time to sit and watch a story. Play a video game, watch a story, game, story, game, story, on and on and on. This isn't framed as much of a rest between missions to balance out the flow of action either. If it was, it might have had a bit more consistency to it, but that's thwarted by the fact that the pacing of the manga dictates the pacing of how the story is told in the game. And this constant stop-and-go approach is just not conducive to how a designer would structure a story if the flow of the game was put first. The story of Berserk is so tightly knit that if you try to create a game that follows it, it can be extraordinarily difficult to take any creative freedom and stray from the path without it seeming like useless padding. Conversely, adhering too close to the story can be detrimental if the story doesn't correlate well with the structure of the game, as is the case here. In short, how you pace a movie is different from how you'd pace a TV series, is different from how you'd pace a manga, is different from how you'd pace a video game. The expectations and the way we consume different media types is different, and there's simply no way you can properly adapt one into another without making serious changes. At some point, you'll find yourself trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. This isn't to say that creating a faithful and well-executed adaptation can't exist, just that when you're dealing with something with as little wiggle room as Berserk, you're fighting a tremendous uphill battle. Omega Force's weapons for fighting this battle are excessively long movie footage use, prolonged dialogue-heavy events, and emitting or altering huge swaths of material. Truly, a greater recipe for success hath never before been conceived. Actually animated cutscenes are few and far between, but it's quite refreshing to finally actually see a well-animated scene thrown into the mix when they do come around. I understand it would have been a monumental task to animate every single scene like this, but event scenes just tend to feel more like glorified puppet shows, and watching them isn't very engaging or interesting. Compared to Millennium Falcon's story elements, which were much more tolerable by being presented in caringly crafted cutscenes that were enjoyable to watch, not to mention were all tastefully brief. Band of the Hawk's stiff, stoic puppet shows work when it's just two characters exchanging playful dialogue, but aren't well suited for portraying actual story moments. Again, it could be a budget issue, but they're decidedly lacking. Not to mention that if you skip some of the optional ones, you'll miss out on some vital plot information. The entire build-up for Mosgus, for example, is tucked away in this optional event tab. That over-reliance on movie footage becomes even more apparent once the story goes beyond the Golden Age arc and the availability to fall back on it ends. This also highlights how poorly the team is at handling exposition once they're forced to handle it all themselves. It's also at this time where we see the story beats are rapidly run through, and where an alarming majority of side content is discarded or changed in order to keep the story moving. For the most part, the Golden Age arc is fairly well paced. Ignoring the fact that the movie scenes bear the brunt of the story, you'll still see most of your favorite characters even if they only exist as part of the provided footage. You'll play through all the iconic scenes and events, and generally get the impression that everything's been put together fairly cohesively. As far as I'm aware, the only notable omission would be Minister Foss and most of the Child Guts content, but that's reasonable enough. 
In fact, the biggest flaw with the Golden Age arc is that someone like me who has A. read the manga, B. watched the 1997 anime, and C. already seen the movies, going through the Golden Age for a fourth time is more of a chore at this point, especially since the alternatives were far more complete and executed better. Admittedly, I'm part of a fairly small demographic, but still, I doubt many people were really aching to see yet another interpretation of the Golden Age arc. But because they had access to those movie clips, they just had to cover it. Advantageously, it tells that integral origin story, and saved a lot of work in creating cutscenes, but it didn't really seem necessary. The movies are already an easily accessible way of introducing oneself to Berserk, and if they didn't bother with the Golden Age themselves, they could have focused on fleshing out the events that took place afterward, and having seen that content in its current state, I can tell you it sure could have used it. It's a shame that the portion of the story which contained the highest caliber and variety of story elements was perhaps the one that was least necessary to include to begin with. In terms of unique adaptation material, Band of the Hawk really only had the Black Swordsman and Conviction arcs, both of which cover exceedingly small content and, in regards to the Conviction arc, was already being bested by the 2016 anime. Which, I mean, you have to be really bad for that to happen. Let me quickly go over the Black Swordsman arc as it's told in-game. You're basically told about the Snake and Slug Barons, and then make your way through some war-torn town until you find them and fight them, with no story beyond that. No Vargas, Teresia, Zone Dark, no encounter with the God Hand, no introduction to the Abyss, all the things that were really vital to the story of the Black Swordsman are swept under the rug, and in its place are hodgepodge missions with boss fights with big baddies and zero actual story content. These were originally prologue chapters, so most of the concepts introduced within them have already been explained at the end of Golden Age, but that's no reason to drop them completely. Hoping to finally see an adaptation of The Lost Children? Skipped entirely. How about Conviction Arc? Well, they only bothered to create two missions for that, which means they removed the whores and Elaine, Mosgus's torturers, and even the goat demon with a snake penis. They're all missing. It's basically... just Mosgus. The game tries to hastily cover all the important bits, but it's all the bits, big and small, that make Berserk what it is. You can't just trim the fat and expect the same experience, because, as we all know, the fat is the flavor. Millennium Falcon managed to cover most of the material present in the manga. The things it skipped over were mostly nitty-gritty exposition and quieter character moments that weren't necessary for the immediate plot without ever feeling rushed, and still had room to fit in an original side story. Band of the Hawk just flat-out cuts entire characters, side stories, and whole chapters, which then has the effect of souring and depreciating the grand story as a whole, a textbook example of biting off way more than they could chew. A Berserk fan will obviously know better, and this game was targeted specifically for the fans. I had no notion that they would cover every little detail, and I didn't mind if they skipped some things here and there because the manga will always be there to keep the record straight. But that doesn't prevent how lousy it is to see large chunks of content missing, and all due to an unnecessarily overextended reach. The best way to create an adaptation that fans will appreciate is to create one that presents events properly enough that it could be recommended even for newcomers. Relying on the fact that a fan will know better is a half-assed excuse to deliver an unfinished and substandard product. So many moments simply lack their proper impact, and it makes it difficult to take anything that happens seriously. If they cared about the story enough to follow its events so strictly, they should have cared enough to actually fill it out properly. They didn't have to try to do it all in one game either. Omega Force has split properties like this into multiple titles before, and while I haven't played them, I can't imagine that was anything but a good thing for preserving smoother narrative pacing. Even with all the material that's been cut, and even though I mentioned that events transpire in a quick short succession, the presentation of the story still takes up a disproportionately large amount of time. It's quite evident to me that a Musou just isn't well suited for stories as large and complex as Berserk's. To help contextualize how quickly the game tries to sprint through events and how much it tries to cram in the story with what it has, I mentioned earlier that the entirety of the Tower of Conviction spans just two missions, but that's not even the worst of it. The entire events that take place in Vertanis, from arrival to boat, is just one mission, and I could easily list off many more examples of cut or altered content. It may have been better to explore a broadened scope within a smaller frame, such as fleshing out certain aspects within the confines of a single chapter. The Lost Children chapter, all on its own for example, seems to be a perfect self-contained story that could easily be expanded and explored. Alternatively, you could find a way to work with something original, like in the case of Sword of the Berserk. Just don't rely too heavily on the story or you'll have people like me wishing that you just made it into the manga instead. To help illustrate what I'm trying to say here, if you take games that are inspired by Berserk, like Dark Souls or Dragon's Dogma, you can see how the ability to take various elements and use them along with the freedom of creating original stories and scenarios allows one to craft a compelling experience without being tied down by a predetermined series of events. For example, the games in the Souls series are better Berserk games than any of the actual Berserk games, and what makes them great Berserk games is specifically because they're not about Berserk. 
If you take a look at some of the rules that writers and poets bind themselves to, the restrictions can result in very creative and inventive solutions that never would have come about if they had absolute freedom. But here we have a case where the creativity required to actively avoid those kinds of restrictions is what probably would have been a more favorable approach. In the last video I mentioned how it can still be fun just to see how things are translated and act out the events yourself, but just as in the last game, you get a pretty accurate account of how things are going to play out in just the first few missions, and the rest of the experience feels like going through the motions. In other words, you're merely following the flow of causality rather than even attempting to struggle against it. Berserk is host to a lot of great set pieces, characters, and events, and the thought that it would be cool to see them in a game discredits how well and integral it is when they were interpreted in their original format. That, in a way, leads us to the topic of presentation, and credit where it's due, the game looks fantastic. The art style they chose mixes a good blend of realism with some of its grittier details and the semi-cartoonish manga look of the characters, and some surprisingly detailed touches spread throughout the characters and environments. It's a good-looking game, and with a good use of color that's mostly well-animated, and feels like a satisfying incarnation of the Berserk universe. Except for Zod again, who looks like a plastic figure, but par for the course. Of course, on a technical level, seeing so many enemies on the screen at once combined with the crazy effects layered on the screen can be quite surprising how well the game retains an impressively stable FPS. The voice performances, provided by the same voice actors as the 2016 anime, aren't quite as expressive in-game as they are in the animated material, but are still plenty serviceable. And at least Isidro doesn't sound like a 40-year-old man this time. <laughs> on the topic of music, the game is, again, quite serviceable. Nothing out of this world or memorable, but not too bland either. You could consider that a success, the way that music doesn't distract from the main experience, but I would argue that thanks to Susumu Hirasawa's contributions to the franchise, Berserk has become known for supplying fantastic musical accompaniments. But as I mentioned earlier, Hirasawa was absent for this project, so that distinct flair of his is missing too, but I can still offer some praise for adequacy, at least. Do you think if Hirasawa wrote the title track for this game, he'd call it Omega Forces? Anyway, all this is to say that the presentation is good, which is pretty typical of an Omega Force game. They're very easy on the eyes, and generally provide a decent spectacle for you to just sit and appreciate, and it's unfortunate that the best they have to offer is this superficial element. Band of the Hawk does too little with too much. Battles explored through boring scenarios, and story explored by neutered anime footage and glorified puppet shows as they try to blaze through 32 volumes of manga in one go. All that Band of the Hawk really has going for it is some moments of absurd wish-fulfillment scenarios just for the dumb fun of it. Mashing two buttons and marking off checklists is the long and short of Band of the Hawk's gameplay qualities, and the gameplay loop created by them is short and shallow. As we've already seen, adapting Berserk into a video game is a hard enough task as it is, but on top of that, having to adapt it into a Musou is even harder. Take the literal Tower of Conviction, for example. Being that we're stuck within the constraints of a Musou, the tower is less of a tower and more of an extended, winding hallway with just a few stairs. There's barely any feeling of verticality to it because that's just not how a Musou level is designed. You're taking the wide, sprawling, and varied world of Berserk and cramming it into a Musou mold, and it's simply a shape Berserk was never designed to fit into. The gameplay and handling of the property are exceedingly less than subpar. Its stylish looks and character mashups are its greatest qualities, but ultimately aid only in the act of creating the video game equivalent of taking your two favorite toys and smashing them together with little to no substance beyond. It's a little tough to play through these games and not feel a sense of fondness for the previous two games, even though they weren't particularly great either. Berserk and the Band of the Hawk is not a good Berserk game, or even a good Muso. It's a flat-out bad adaptation and an unfulfilling experience overall. The game seems to have been made under the premise that because Guts sometimes kills a lot of enemies with a big sword, that it's somehow a good fit for a Muso. And it's no surprise to see how that line of thinking created a product that scarcely accounted for Berserk's deeper, integral qualities that make it so adored. And so, as the game winds down to a close, suffice to say that this is a boat which I sincerely hope they don't ever manage to get off of. Well, that's all of them. For now, anyway. It's a real shame that none of them were really any good. If you happen to watch all three of these videos, then I can't thank you enough. I hope to see you in the next one. It's your fault! Dad Zam Fighting Line is God! You shut f you! God f it. You destroyed everything! You evil maniacal little over pumped mature muscular! I got a big sword but don't know what to do with it! Who left without saying goodbye?